I witnessed all of the stuff that everyone complains about with middle schoolers, that they're, they're vicious or they can be really mean or they can be really gossipy or they can be really self-indulged. But I honestly see all of that behavior in everybody. Donovan Taylor Hall, I have many thoughts on what you do. I mean, child educator. I've heard the term that you're the future or present now, Mr. Rogers. I, I agree with that, but I think you bring so much more to the experience. It's, I do love the Mr. Rogers movie. Uh, I think it's really powerful. And I think your movie is exceptionally and personally powerful. So I'm excited to get into it. It's a, that's like such a huge, like, Thing to put on someone when I was just getting started too. I was like, whoa, I mean, I'm so great. It's really interesting because now a lot of people are asking me to like sing and, and do songs for little kids. My work is way more about like middle schoolers and high schoolers, but I mean, he was a youth advocate and he was a really important public figure for kids. And so that's always been my dream. So to be compared to that um, or even put in the same category as that is just a huge, huge honor. So yeah, where did that originate? It's kind of wild in terms of the trajectory that it's been, but I sat down with my two brothers in Oakland maybe a year before the pandemic started, and we planned kind of like what we all wanted to do in our different career paths. And I told them that was the first time I said out loud was like, I kind of see myself as like a Mr. Rogers type figure because when I was moving into speaking for kids, I just realized there's so many people talking and so many people that kids are watching, but how many people are talking to kids like directly, um, like the way that he did. And so I used that. And then when the Today Show interviewed me, I don't know if Hoda said it or if they kind of just coined it, but then it was just, that was it. <laughs> so I've been riding that wave since then. It's a good wave to ride. Where does the origination of your passion for this stem from? Because you're clearly very passionate about teaching kids, engaging with kids, you know, almost like through your interaction with them, giving them a space to be all of them. And, you know, I think that's like every parent's dream they wish they could provide, or maybe not every parent's, some aren't even conscious of the need for that. So where did that originate for you? It was all so random, but also so serendipitous. It's it's kind of wild to look at it from the, like a larger kind of picture. I, I started working with kids because this woman who taught me theater told me I should. And I like laughed at her when she said it because I was like 19. And I think I'd like, I like came to class, like hung over that day, like was just being obnoxious and stuff. And she was like, well, I have this theater company and you should work. You should come try it out. And I like, just like, why would I work with kids? Like that had no passion for that. I was studying journalism and theater in college and I did it and it was really fun. So I kept doing it. I kept doing the positive youth development programs. I then taught like gymnastics. I taught like drones. I taught leadership camps. It was just really, really fun. But at the same time, I was going through a pretty huge transformational shift with myself. Um, I'd had a really kind of, you know, I'd almost lost it in terms of taking my life when I was in college. And this was around the same time I found my work with kids. And when that wasn't an option anymore, I knew that I needed to get to the core of this. Something is wrong, right? Like I almost took my life. I need to figure out how to feel better. And so I started just doing all of this deep research into, you know, mental well-being, into positive psychology, um, into like leadership studies and stuff to kind of to, to build a stronger foundation with myself because I just knew that I, I hated myself so much. Like that was just a huge thing. I was popular. Like I, I had good grades. Like it was none of those kind of normal, you know, things that would make people kind of question their identity. But I just had this deep disconnect with myself that I wasn't really even able to hold space for. So working with kids was like, it just felt right. You know, it felt like I don't have to worry about all of the stress and the hurt and the pain when I'm with the kids, like they're laughing, they're having fun. And then I started thinking about, as I'm doing research into all the self-development stuff, like it's very clear that we need to be teaching kids some of this stuff earlier on because no one is talking to kids about how to have a positive relationship with themselves. And, you know, the closest that we were getting at that time was like we were pushing inclusion and it was like inclusion is very important, but a lot of these kids don't even know how to be kind to themselves or a lot of these kids are, are still struggling with not liking themselves. 
so I had the, I had the kind of opportunity to just bring some of the stuff that I was learning into my curriculum. And then that was the stuff that was getting feedback. Like parents were talking about that work versus like the theater or the other after school stuff. And so when I was 25, I just made a commitment. I brought all my friends together. I had a, when I grow up, I want to be party. So you had to dress up as what you wanted to be when you were a kid. Oh, that's cool. Did you get to wear a shirt like that or what did you do? <laughs> I dressed up as I think like a teacher, maybe. I can't remember what I did, but I told, I just, I told all my friends, I was like, this is my dream. Like, and I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I want to help kids and I want to be like a public figure for them um, to teach them this stuff. And that was you know, almost 10 years ago. And it's just been, it's been wild since then. In the past year, it like completely hyper accelerated, but it's been a, it's been a journey. And I think that's really where it started was just kind of seeing how it was helping me and then wanting to, to bring that to kids so they didn't have to go through the same thing. Yeah. You know, so many of our passions are born from wanting to walk people through the things that we needed to be walked through. Or like we wish someone we become the teacher we needed. I was really fascinated by listening to your story just of your childhood, like of your experience of almost like without choice being put into a performative role. And, you know, we all take roles in our families and yours seem to have been one of keeping everyone from feeling pain, which is not, you know, it's great. Levity is so important. And I think you do such a beautiful job of that, of, of not just children, but people who get to experience you experience the joy that you bring. Like you bring levity to life's challenges. You, you, people are feeling grief and yet they're laughing, which is a weird paradox to be in, but there's no better way to hold something than to just be able to do it and joy be in the room too, you know? And I was really just like inspired by your story that you told about, I think it was your father's funeral. Would you be open to sharing some of that story? Yeah, it's it's so interesting because I thought that I had it all figured out too. And then the last maybe three, four years of my life, it was like, oh, there's a whole new phase that I have to go through. So to talk about it, it's like, it's like interesting to talk about it in the different phases. Yeah. When I was a kid, um, my dad passed away when I was uh, seven. He passed away from leukemia. And at the funeral, it was all kind of blurry. But at the funeral, I remember um, sitting in my mom's lap and she, I, I just remember looking up at her and she was, you know, a wreck and she was crying. I'm the youngest of four boys. And I told her a joke and I told her a joke about my dad. I said, at least I don't have to eat beans anymore. And she laughed like really loud. And I remember people were like, kind of, you know, tripped out by the fact that she was laughing, but it's a funeral. And she told that story for years and she would always be like, you know, that's how he was trying to understand grief and that's how he was processing it. But I remember even when I was a kid, before I even had the words to articulate it, I remember thinking like, that's not why I did that, right? I remember I did that because I wanted to make her feel better. That was the goal is I was like, I can make her laugh right now. And so that, that started this whole trajectory of like, you be good, be good. And that will help people. And when I was younger, it was like grades and, you know, like, uh, extracurricular activities and stuff. And then when I got into high school, it was more about, you know, making other people happy, like my friends, but I was really struggling with substance abuse stuff. And so this role then even got kind of spilled into my work where it was like, you make kids feel better. It was like, you make your mom feel better. You make your friends feel better. You make kids feel better. I remember thinking when I was in high school, when we got our superlatives, I got most likely to brighten your day. And I had been like self-harming like two weeks before that. And I just remember thinking about like who these people see and how these people use me or how these people like want me in their life is so disconnected from how I feel about myself. And I remember when I got that award, I went to the bathroom and I cried because I was like, cause everyone was clapping. And I was, I was so shocked that that was the superlative I got. And so it was interesting to see that people could see that in me, but I couldn't see it in myself. And when I started working with kids, it was more about like they felt it and they didn't, it's not like they, the adults in my life used me, but it was like kids, it was just felt more pure. It was like, they just enjoyed being in that presence and they felt better and, and felt lifted up and stuff like that. It's wild to see how, even when I started doing this work, 
I was still disconnected from myself. I was pushing myself to the point of exhaustion. I was putting other people before me. I was going to like soccer games for kids. I was, you know, talking to parents on the phone. I was helping my friends with whatever they needed. I was in grad school. I had like three or four jobs at the same time. And all of my jobs were dedicated to taking care of people. And I just collapsed. I got to a point where there was nothing left and I couldn't do it. And I didn't make the connection until I was in Oakland. I didn't make the connection of why I was still so sad and why I was still so struggling, especially when my work was getting lifted up and I was helping kids. There was still this huge disconnect. And and that's where I really discovered the core of my work now with kids of, of helping them understand that your value comes from your humanity, not like the tool that you are for other people. So I can use the things that I'm good at to help other people. But when I was using them when I was younger, it was more about I'm doing this to feel loved and I'm doing this to feel safe. Like if I'm not taking care of other people, then I have nothing to offer. Right. And if I have nothing to offer, then there's no safety. And there's so much of that in like what kids feel throughout the day of like, I have nothing to offer. I have no safety. I have no, no one loves me unless I do these things. And so I try really hard to help kids kind of think about their identity and think about building a relationship with themselves so that whatever they decide to do, it comes from a place of like a connection to oneself versus like, I feel like I have to play this role or I have to be this person for other people. I mean, what I hear in there too, is that in that checking of the boxes, and like having the good grades, being funny, being bringing levity, there's this also absence of being able to see you, like truly you. And of course we can say part of that is actually, you know, I certainly was the class clown. I was the person who made jokes. I used charisma to avoid being witnessed, like in the depth of my sensitivities, only that to then in the monitoring or taking care of other people's feelings, realizing that I'm not servicing my own. Like I, I so desperately want to be witnessed, but I'm the greatest uh, co-signer in the inability to witness me. I still think that is a layer that continues to be, like you said, I thought I had it figured out and then I constantly am like, I don't know fucking anything. But when I hear you talking about the checking of the boxes and then this disconnect between how you feel versus how people think you feel and what they get from you, which is really beautiful, but it's like you're bringing now the the plethora, not just the checking of the boxes and not, because I think adults go, I checked all the boxes. I'm doing all the things. I have the job I'm taught to. I have the family. I have the marriage. I have the whatever it is. And yet I feel so disconnected because my life has been in service of outcomes and other and check marks and Never about what do I actually fucking want? Like, who am I? I don't know, man. That that feels like that might be one of the greatest pandemics as well. You know, is this, what does materialism do? What do companies sell to? They sell to that disconnect. They sell to pay enough money to get this thing or get this uh, alteration or wear these clothes and you'll finally feel fucking whole. And so there's no like desire to to fix that from that perspective because it's monetizable. But I think it's it's when you were just talking about it too, I was like, that's school for kids. That's that's what we are conditioned to experience, which is you get good grades, right? You get good grades, you have friends, you you play it, you do extracurricular activities, you're good. And that's not the case. I had so many kids. Who were having like mental breakdowns in my classroom during breaks. And these were the kids that had the best grades. These were the kids that had friends, the kids that were popular. I had, I had space and time for every kid, the kid who felt like no one liked them versus the kid that felt the pressure from everyone looking at them. There was this larger thing that was happening with middle schoolers specifically that no one was willing to sit down with them and talk about. And no one was willing to hold space for it was this, that they are aware that they're trying to live up to all these people's expectations, right? So when pe- people will call and say, well, kids care about video games and they need to care about their school more. And I'm like, it's the same stuff. Like you're telling, you're still telling them they need to focus on this thing that is not outside, you know, that is outside of them. But the the expectations that they feel from other people, while also not only not knowing who they are, but then actively feeling themselves disconnect 
feeling themselves disconnect from who they felt, feeling themselves being insecure, really struggling to figure out who they are, getting feedback from so many different people about who they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to act, including parents, including friends, including people who were bullying them, including social media, including influencers. Like there's so much that kids have to deal with. And yet we as a society, we continuously shit on middle school. Like if you ask adults about middle school, there's like a gut reaction. I've only met like two people who have been like, I love middle school. I thrived. And I'm like, ew. <laughs> I did not thrive in middle school. I felt like I used to teach soccer camps to kids and we'd get the age ranges were kind of like five and six, then seven and nine, and then 10 to 13. I think that was roughly the breakdown. And what I noticed with five and six, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, I five and six, I noticed these kids didn't have much identity yet. Like they were different colors, they were different genders, and they were just playing soccer. They were just running around. They weren't even playing soccer. They were playing games where a ball just happened to be. There. <laughs> and then you had like seven, but especially eight and nine. Eight and nine is where I started to see if someone had a disability or someone was shorter or someone, what, I didn't see anything about color, but I saw like where the identity started to be formed. And there was like, that's where I look back also on my childhood. And I'm like, man, it was about like 10, 11 that I felt social structure start to be built. And I felt like I was, as it was being built, I was watching it be built above me. And where I had all these friends that were, there was no hierarchy, at least not that I noticed. All of a sudden I noticed it because I was at the bottom of it or like close to the bottom. And, you know, I forget what the theory is, but it's that the people who know how the system work are not the people at the top of the system. It's actually the people at the bottom of the system. And that's true economically. That's true of social programs. That's true. And I think that's actually pretty dead on because I knew how the social hierarchy was working, at least unconsciously. But then through like grade seven, eight, nine, which in Canada is middle school, I think it's six, seven, or it's seven, eight. Uh, six, seven, eight, or seven or eight. Yeah. And that's when I really noticed like it was such a clusterfuck. And kids in that age group are not generally that nice because everyone's like has no idea who they are. And they're like, yeah, you know, like, what's your experience as a teacher? Am I kind of getting that? how it works and is there more to it? And can you give us more insight on what that process is and why your work is so important actually in that time? When you see, when I see like adults fighting with their, you know, their arms up and their shoulders up and they're defending their beliefs or they're defending this idea or traditions or stuff like that, it reminds me of middle school. It reminds me of that same kind of fear, right? Of like, I don't feel safe if I am vulnerable and being in middle school is vulnerability. You know, your bodies are changing, your hormones are changing, your brains are still developing. Even the way that we treat kids in America in school drastically shifts from elementary school to middle school. I witnessed all of the stuff that everyone complains about with middle schoolers, that they're, they're vicious or they can be really mean or they can be really gossipy or they can be really self-indulged. But I honestly see all of that behavior in everybody. If you haven't heard me talk about Cozy Earth Sheets before, let me tell you, I'm about to introduce you to the greatest sheets you will ever have touch your body. Anytime someone comes to our house and stays in our guest room, they always wanna know what is the bed situation? What are the sheets that we have? Their sheets, their comforters, their duvets, everything is magic. Their bedding is naturally breathable. It's temperature regulating. It's so damn soft. It's ethically sourced viscose from bamboo. It's incredible. And the brand was featured on Oprah's favorite thing but before that, it was featured on Mark's favorite things. Like I discovered this brand years ago before I ever even chatted with them about being a sponsor for the podcast. And because I love their product so much, I asked for an exclusive offer for you and you get 40% off site-wide. And now they have pajamas. They have like loungewear. So not only do you get to wrap yourself in the experience of the sheets as clothing, but you then get to get into the bed in that. So you're like double wrapped. And so all you got to do to save 40% off site-wide is use the code GROVES at checkout. So just my last name, G-R-O-V-E-S. So go to CozyEarth.com. C-O-Z-Y-E-A-R-T-H dot com and use the code Groves and you get 40% off all their products. I wanted to tell you about a new product that I've come across that's called Element. And their branding's pretty cool. You've probably seen it. It's L-M-N-T and it's a delicious electrolyte drink. 
So I've been traveling a lot more and whenever I travel, I feel dehydrated. So I've been bringing these little mixture packs that are the perfect science back electrolyte ratio, which is a thousand milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium but it has none of the junk that's normally in these types of drinks. So no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS. And I've been using this at post-workout, as I said, with traveling, and it's delicious. They have a, quite a few different flavors. My favorite so far is the orange and the raspberry. And so if I'm feeling depleted, dehydrated, have a headache, feeling like I'm fatigued, I've been just taking one of these and they're really good. You just mix them with, you know, a bottle of water and there you go. And so uh, traveling, they're great. They're just little packages. And right now, Element is offering for my listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. So you get eight different flavors to try out and you can either keep it for yourself or give it to a friend. All you got to do is go to drinklmnt.com slash create the love. This deal is only available through my link, so you got to go to D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash create the love. And Element offers no questions asked refunds, so try it totally risk-free. If you don't like it, share it with a salty friend, and they will give you your money back, no questions asked. You have nothing to lose. Right. As adults, we're all just middle schoolers walking around. Like, literally, literally, just look at social media, right? It's it's such a... It's a big part of like our society, but when I started looking at it that way, I realized it's because we have so many adults who are walking around afraid and so many adult, adults who are walking around guarded. And because like, that's how I was as a person. I mean, I felt like if I didn't have this role I was playing, I believed so deeply, if I'm not helping people, then I'm not worth anything, right? And so that pushed me to, to push myself to the point of exhaustion. I mean, I had a seizure when I was teaching and was back in the classroom like within a month because I was so afraid of like letting things fall apart and blah, blah, blah. I had to be there for the kids and I had to hold space for them. But I, I think with middle school, what I've also seen is character, like, un, like raw character. And that's how I, like, I view that with kids where it's like, I'm a huge fan of the X-Men, like, huge fan not the movies as much but the comics and i use it to talk to kids about their character strengths because at that age a lot of their strengths are coming out but they're very much not developed and they're not defined and so that's why you have things like the class clowns who have humor right or communication skills they're misusing them or they're coming out in ways that are getting them in trouble or the kids who are empathetic like the kids who are involved in everybody's drama and trying to take care of everyone or you know the kids who are telling everybody what to do like all the time like the leadership skills are kind of coming out and when they were given a space to articulate them and develop them they had more power and more control i've also seen that when learning is safe right when learning is not about getting good grades to be valued right it's more about who, what do I know now that I didn't know before? It's more about expansion, which is, is growth. And that's what I really care about. That's what I really care about for kids. If a kid has a D and they go to a C, that's growth and hard work and effort, right? But because it's not an A, a lot of times those kids don't recognize it. And so in and, and middle school, they're just growing rapidly. They're growing mentally. They're growing emotionally. They're growing physically. And my dream, my dream, I was going to say my goal, but my dream really is to help kids take care of themselves while they're growing, right? So not to be mean to themselves, to practice self-compassion, to practice forgiveness, to practice, you know, self-inquiry, to practice um, self-love, right? Because that, that growing part is how they're going to figure out who they are in the world, right? And, and it's so important that they have these moments where they struggle because this is how you figure out who you are. But what I'm seeing middle school is that it's more about suffering, that these kids are just unhappy and don't know where to turn and, and have no one to talk to except for their friends who are also unhappy and don't know how to process things. And when we give them space to really articulate and understand and then tools to take care of themselves in it, it's, it's amazing to see the transformation that kids can have. And I, I think the best way that I can describe this is I had a situation at the school where the art teacher quit and they needed a new teacher, but the situation was really bad. 
the art teacher had caused a lot of harm to the kids. The kids, kids had caused a lot of harm to the art teacher. They had caused harm to the room. They had caused harm to each other. So when I took the position over, like kids were purposely being kicked out of that class because it was like that miserable. But these are my babies. Like I knew them. They were in my other class. So I was like, no, no, they just need some love. And I got in there and I didn't realize how much harm had been caused. Like in the environment. Yeah, just in general, it felt like weird. Same kids, different space. Like they were in my class regularly. But then I, because there was two teachers in my class and I left that class to take over the art position. So it's not like I was a new teacher. They'd known me for a few years, right? My boss was like, please, you're the only one that has like a real relationship with them. Please save these kids because this space is really struggling. And when I went in there, the first thing we thought about was like, what harm had been done. So I opened up a circle space. We talked about rules about like how to show up in this space, how to be honest and open. And we started thinking about what harm had been caused in the room. And the first thing the kids jumped to was what the teacher had done to them. And they went around the circle and then they, they owned it and they talked about it and it was pretty emotional. And then it became about other teachers. It was just like, here's harm that we feel as kids in general. Then they were just talking about that. And then suddenly they were talking about harm they had done to each other. And then suddenly they were talking about harm they had done to themselves. And then they asked for that class two more times. Like they came back in and I was like, we can, we can start the next step or do y'all want to come back to circle? And they're like circle. And we did it three times. Like no one forced them to do it. They just wanted to talk about and understand like why they had been doing the things that they were doing. Right. For them to say, for them to say, I destroyed the property because I felt like the teacher didn't respect us right? And I was mad. That's a huge learning to have. And it was just such a powerful moment. They got to tear the room down. They got to do like designs and they all got to vote on which design was the best for the new class. And they put the room back together and they cleaned the tables and stuff. That's so powerful. It was so, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. It was so restorative. And I just saw that when I, if I came from a place of love, if I came from a place of like no judgment, right? Like, let's just be authentic and let's talk about it. When I could own that, that teacher had caused them harm and also hold them accountable for their own harm that they caused, right? Then it became about healing. And so I think about that experience a lot because they just didn't, they didn't have a lot of the words. They didn't have a lot of the language. They didn't know how to connect the feeling with you know, like the shame and regret and guilt. Like some of the kids wrote the teacher apology letters at the end of it. No one asked them to, but they had just reflected on it. And so when I think about, I think about how kids feel about themselves. When I have kids reflect, when I talk to the kids who I have relationships with, they, they articulate their thoughts out loud. And so many of them are really just tough. They're really hard on themselves, uh, whether they're getting good grades or not, right? Or even in between, whether they feel seen, whether they don't, whether they feel like the love in their life is conditional or it's unconditional. I just saw that they needed a space to talk about it. And I think that that's been the, the greatest gift that I've been able to offer any kid that I've worked with is just space to be and then to be like held as, as who you are. And then you can think about these deeper, bigger things. And it, it sounds dramatic to some people, but you know, I'll be real with you. I look at the world in general, it's like we have so many people moving from a place of fear, right? Where it's like, you can't, you can't tell me this. I can't do this. You can't tell me what to do, blah, blah, blah. Or like these people will do this to me. There's so much fear. And I also see that there's so much disconnect from personal self. I talk to so many adults who struggle with the same things that my kids struggle with. And, and I think that moving the way that we're moving in this planet in terms of sustainability and in terms of growing as a society, we need more people who are moving from a place of humanity versus a place of fear. But right now, especially with our education system, everything is set up to push kids to continue that same track of like, check off the boxes. If I do this, then I'll be happy versus starting off with before you even think about who you are as a friend, before you even think about who you are as like a, a change maker in this world, who are you to yourself? And they talk, I talk a lot to kids about bullying because bullying is a big thing, but I talk a lot to kids about self-bullying, right? Because that's who I was. I was my biggest bully. I didn't have the external bullies and I'm so grateful. I didn't have that because I knew how to be charming and fun and I had friends and safety around me. But when I got into my room at the end of the night, 
it was, all, you know what I mean? I was beating the crap out of myself. I was so hard on myself for years, for years. And I had to learn how to, to take that, you know, like Jen says, to take that inner asshole and turn it into my best friend because that's that, that inner asshole is trying to protect me. That inner asshole is trying to serve this purpose for me, but it's doing it from a fear-based approach. It's doing it from don't, don't put yourself out there. Don't risk yourself. Don't, you know, let yourself be in love, right? Because these things will hurt you. And then I realized that that's like, that's kind of like my inner child. That's like the inner me trying to protect me. And I had to then sit with that child and, and, and offer them love and let them know that they're safe, right? And that I don't need things that limit me. I need things that help me expand and help me grow. And, and I try to do that same work with kids to help them understand that, you are, you are responsible for your growth and expansion in this world. And sometimes you have to start with the safety on the inside because these outside sources will not give us that. They won't give us the space, especially like my black and brown boys, especially my queer kids. Like you have to create inner safety to hold space for the tough things, but we don't have a lot of that opportunity. So that's why I'm, I want to be a public figure is because you don't know what these parents are telling these kids. You don't know how much pressure they're putting on them or how conditional their love may feel or what these teachers are saying or what their friends are saying. But if there's kids who are alone, who are struggling and can say, I know where I can go to learn or feel better or choose these things that feel good for me, I want to go there. And then that's who I want to be for kids. Well, for a kid to have an adult be a grounded space that allows, like what you did in that room is you were an anchor and a, and a nervous system regulator for all of them to go into deep inquiry. You know, I think of the statement that you can have accountability without annihilation. A like cancel culture is annihilation generally, you know? And it's like, can we have restoration? As you said, you use that word which I love. It's like, can we have restoration and can we sit down and talk about what happened? Like, it sounds to me like what a beautiful space for these kids to first reflect. And, you know, I think so much from adults and education system or healthcare or whatever it is, there's no capacity for shame. Hey, we actually harm these kids. Instead, there's like, you guys fucked up and you're the fuck ups and the the teacher left because of you, but you really created this space where they got to first voice clear, and which is all relationships. It's like, can we have this space for that unconditional expression? I love that also the symbolism of tearing down the room and then rebuilding. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, lose <laughs> yeah. you were telling the story because you think like as a kid, we had a teacher I remember who I completely despised and he did do a lot of harm. But there was no space for that. There was no one who was going to listen to that. You know, we were seen as the problem sent into the hall. And while I was sent in the hall because I did create issues, it was because I just didn't feel safe there. I didn't feel accepted. I didn't. Feel, I wanted to be heard, but I didn't know how. As you said, we don't have the tools. What a beautiful thing to demonstrate to them accountability and restoration and setting a boundary about what's okay in this room or these relationships, what's not. You said that, like that, that cultivation of what is your relationship to yourself? Because you talked about how, you know, these kids are being invited to learn things like inclusion, you know, which is obviously really important. I love what you said, though, that if that doesn't begin with inclusion of self, then how in any way can I model it for anybody else? Because otherwise it's just a construct and it's also almost like just a virtue. Like we check box on a virtue signal but we're not actually doing the deep work of what does inclusion mean? How does that include for you? I mean, think about the line, like treat people like you wanted to be treated. Like, how do you know how you deserve to be treated? You know what I mean? Like, that's what I'm talking about. I was like, we like, like some kids are like, well, I don't, other people treat me like that. And that, that's how I'm supposed to be treated. So I can't treat other people like that. And I was like, oh man. I kind of messed my head up a little bit. I've never thought about it. Like that. That's actually pretty good math when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, he's like, I treat myself like crap. So I treat everybody else like crap. And I was like, wow, that's actually a really good point. Because, you know, I think when I was talking about like growth culture or um, cancel culture and growth culture, growth culture is really important, especially with kids, because there is so much shame around. I made a mistake. I made a mistake and I don't know how to fix this, whether it is like academics Right. And there's that immediate feedback if I got a bad grade 
right? Or it's something that happened in their personal life with their friends, which is a huge thing at that age Very for a very good reason. It helps them figure out who they are. Having the ability to say, I was wrong, or I made a mistake, or owned up for accountability comes from like the safety of that space. And so I've even gone to some organizations that were like, we want our our employees to be more growth mindset oriented. And I'm like, cool, how do you handle people making mistakes? If somebody asks for help and you give them a hard time about it, it's like, you can't ask them to be like that. And it just, it's just so interesting. But I think coming from like a youth development mindset where I didn't have to grade the kids and it was much more about their character development and bringing that into the classroom. I think that that's what really helped me kind of create that safety in the classroom. I mean, uh, extracurricular activities are, are really wonderful, but positive youth development programs, especially like Boys and Girls Club or YMCA, that create space, especially in cities where kids don't have resources like that, like some of the most powerful learning, exploration, kind of identity forming happens in those spaces because it is so much more about your welcome here. You don't have to be a certain way to be welcomed here. But education for so many kids feels like I have to be smart. I have to be smart. And if I'm making mistakes, I'm not smart. And so what we had to redefine the classroom as like, you're going to make mistakes. That is a part of this, right? That is a part of this. And there, there's no shame in making mistakes. But as an adult, we had to model that. I mean, I had a co-teacher. She's like my... I love her. She's my work wife. But when she first started teaching, she was like perfectionist. She was like, I don't want them to know I messed up, blah, blah, blah. Like, let's take this down. And I was like, we're preaching growth mindset. We might have to show them a little bit that we make mistakes and that we can learn from them. And so then it got, became a thing where if we didn't know how to do something, the kids were excited to share and teach us how to do it. It was like a co-regulated learning space. And it's like, oh, it's okay to ask for help. Oh, it's okay to guess when we're not sure, right? And so just understanding what that looks like is really, really powerful. But I try to take it a step further even and, and think about how do you create that safety within where it is like, yes, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to mess up, right? And I'm going to, I'm going to struggle. I'm going to need to ask for help. These things are okay. You know, doing this work and stuff, I got so many messages from people being like, oh, you're such a good person and blah, blah, blah. I don't think I'm a good person. I, I straight up, I tell everybody that I don't view people as I think you're a good or a bad person. I think that you do these things and I try really hard to do good because the truth is I've done things in the past that hurt people. I, there are people walking around, no matter how much good I try to do in the world, who will still see me as a villain in their story because of things that I did when I was a 20 year old hurt person, right? And so for me to say, oh, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, right? It takes away from the fact that, yes, I've harmed people in the past, but also all of the work that went into learning and unlearning why those things were, you know, not okay and, and how to do better and, and to commit. I am a better friend today because of the people that I harmed when I was younger and I had to learn from those situations. And, and I need to wear that. I need to wear that openly and authentically because I don't want kids to say, well, that's just Mr. Donovan. He's just really nice or blah, blah, blah. I want them to know that I have to work on these things. I have to work to every day. I have to intentionally choose to do good. Right. And so even when we, so I'm doing this project called kids do the dopest things where I talk to kids about their amazing projects that they've been doing. I've talked to kids about creating blessing bags for uh, people experiencing homelessness, for a girl who ran a diversity golf clinic for black girls, for kids who have like a kid who did bow ties for shelter animals, like to help them get adopted. And I'm asking them these questions and they keep getting caught up because I'm asking them about the process. I'm not like, you know, tell me your biggest accomplishment. Tell me how proud you are, blah, blah, blah. Like we all know that this is the outcome because we can all see it, right? But let's talk about the doubt. Let's talk about what support looked like for you. Let's talk about the highs and the lows of getting to where you're at. Because when we can lift those parts up, we can lift growth up as, as in general, like authentic growth, right? Then we can start to, to allow kids to feel better about that than just I have good or bad grades, right? And when I work with kids specifically, it's like kids don't like themselves. And it's like, okay, but you can get there. You can do the work just like if you're struggling in math, right? Just like if you're struggling to make friends, just like if you're struggling um, with any kind of skill, 
you can do the work to get where you're at right now. And I'm the proof for them. I'm like, I didn't have this relationship with myself. I wasn't a super motivational person as a 17 year old. I was like drunk and high and like throwing house parties and crying in my bathroom all the time. Right. Like I was not the same person, but I put work in and that's the stuff that I want to teach. And that's the stuff that needs to be lifted up if we expect kids to really authentically grow into themselves, right? Or to not wait to be proud of themselves until they've hit that accomplishment. What do you think is the most pivotal turning point in your life to that moment of self-inquiry? Like where all of a sudden, because I heard in your story, one thing that I really loved in your story that I found just like implicitly in your telling of it is that you went from a place of, I have to do these things and I have to be this person to I choose to support these people I choose. And so it's like your compensatory strategy of, of the way that you take care of people is now harnessed in a superpower, which is really cool. Yeah. Because it's like, these things are, these things are good. And it's not like if you, t- if you teach kids to take care of themselves that they're suddenly going to become super selfish. Right. I find that most of the time, yeah, that's why people will think that they're like, Oh, these kids are already so full of themselves. And like, they're not really. That messaging with such shit. You know, I think like, it is. it's like, well, I always think of that meme where there's like a couple, uh, you know, like 120 year olds walking down the street holding hands. And they're like, you've been married for 75 years. How did you do it? And it's like, well, we took commitment seriously back when we did it. It's like, fuck you with your shaming bullshit. You don't even like each other. You know, you held hands. <laughs> But I'm not, I'm not into it. I'm not into it. Well, that just pisses me off because, you know, like when we were young, there was a thought that the world was going to fall apart with the new youth. And I didn't grow up with the internet as a teenager, which I think is very different. I, I do think that kids are being asked to hold so much more. They also are being asked to learn so much more. Also, you pop in the pandemic and you've got no kids are resilient. Like we just expect to bulldoze children in this last couple of years, which I mean, even masking kids, I have a lot of thoughts on that because, you know, there was an, in the APA, the American Pediatric Association, they said, well, there's no evidence to support that this will harm development. So this is our benchmark now. There's no evidence. So there's an absence of evidence. So that's evidence. And then they deleted the stuff on their website that said attunement and facial uh, you know, seeing parents' faces is important to protect their message. And I'm like, that's such bullshit. Like, I look at what kids have been through the last couple of years, and I'm like, imagine your graduation year being robbed, which, hey, sure, all the different opinions on what was right, what was not. But we still have to say this impacted kids, right? Like, we still have to sit with them and say, how did we harm you? Like, we need to do that as a society because. Not only that, these kids' only outlets was a fucking Zoom screen. They have social media, which I do want to get your thoughts on social media because I think as a blessing, amazing for connectivity, but as a weapon in children, especially young people to weaponize belonging and like social connection. When you look at the increase in anxiety, especially in young girls in the last decade, really with the advent of social media and with boys too, but especially girls, I just don't know that we can have these tools in the way that they are when their whole purpose is to monetize attention. I just don't know how we can with integrity do that. And I don't know what corporation is going to stop that when they make so much fucking money. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that's moving from a place of, that's moving from a place of fear. We don't have enough, right? Like wealth hoarding is a place of fear. I talk about this too, because I've been shouting about this stuff for years, and I would, I'd like to say that there's tons of research that shows that so much of the way that we're doing education in general harms kids, and we don't even look at that. Why would we? It would require responsibility. That's what I'm saying. We don't even look at that. Teachers are being blamed for the way the education system are, is literally built up. And teachers know, and they're having to fight from within the system to undo harm that's actively being done. So when the pandemic happened, um, and I came from uh, you know communities that there was lots of people who didn't have health insurance, lots of family members who were sick, and so I uh, it very much stood by the school's masking policy, um, and because it, it was a, just a very big community in terms of like everyone's keeping each other safe. But thinking about the school, the school itself was also thinking a lot about like how traditional testing, 
how grades, how these systems like are harming kids, right? And so we rarely ever sit down and, and think, how, how is this affecting kids? Or how are we holding ourselves accountable for the harm that's happening to kids? So I have like tons of thoughts on that too, because I just, yeah, it was like, I, I remember I was teaching gratitude, like it was a unit. And I remember my vice principal was like, okay, cool, grade them. And I was like, ah, like grade their gratitude. <laughs> like, like I get that I get what you're saying that we have to have a grade for this class, but I'm gonna go ahead and give them all a four, which is like an A plus plus, and they're just gonna do the gratitude. Like I'm not gonna go in and be like, this is not grateful enough. Your gratitude is not the right gratitude. Yeah, like that's when I realized I was like, maybe I don't want to be teaching this in a classroom um, because it's still connected to systems of oppression. It's still connected to systems that are harming kids. And then an adult gets to decide and affirm. It's very also like modeling the patriarchal structure of religion. Like I get to decide if you're morally, when you get to the gates of heaven or hell, this outside, usually old white guy gets to decide. My friend calls him Sky Daddy. Sky Daddy gets to decide that when you get to the gates, you know, it's such bullshit. I definitely like understand your perspective and, and appreciate it because I think of the teachers that I know that are asked to hold so much. Parents are being asked to hold more than ever too because to afford life, both parents generally need jobs, but you know, and, and then you think of like what schools generally have access to the structures of teaching emotional regulation. Well, it's usually higher socioeconomic classrooms. It's usually private schools. It's usually Waldorfs and there's nothing wrong with that. That's great that those structures exist, but Every school should have emotional, relational, mental health. All of them should at a baseline. And all teachers should be taught nervous system regulation, what a nervous system is, how it works, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I, when I look at teachers, I'm just like, all the teachers I know are some of the best humans I know. But man, they're like paying money out of their pocket to buy stuff for kids. And we, you know, chastise them for their vacation time in the summer. And I'm like, man, my friends who coach teams, they go from teaching to working and they're not being paid for the coaching. And I'm like, man, I just have so much. They're basically in charge of raising the children of this world. Yeah. Yeah. And you take away, I mean, I, I coach kids individually online right now and it's been, it's been just so wonderful to, to be an extra support to their families. And that's, that's how I push it. It's like, I'm not going to call myself like a life coach for these kids because they're like literally 11 or 12, right? Like they're not worried about their coach. They're, I'm not telling these kids what to do with their lives, but it's like, I get to be a practice partner with them. And I think that that's who, and, and, and the practice is different for each kid, right? For one kid, it's like, I get to practice asking them like to share their thoughts. So with this kid, we're practicing them communicating more with one kid. It's express. I'm practicing holding emotional space, right? So when they're upset, instead of having their parents trying to calm them down, they have someone who they can just get it out with. I have someone who are practicing empathy, right? And it's like, we're doing it through video games because he likes to yell at me when I'm doing bad in video games. And then we can kind of be empathetic and connect back to like, you know, remember I'm a person and I'm new at this and you have to teach me. And so it's, yeah, it's rough. What game was Fortnite? Oh my gosh. I tried to play that with my friends a little with his son. And he was like, you're so bad. I'm like, I am actually, that is an accurate statement, but I also have no idea what you're doing with walls. I'm like, dude, you're building stuff and shooting stuff. And I don't even know what's going on. Can you teach me how to put a wall down? But it's just interesting because it's like, so this whole new project I have, I'm, I'm shifting into, I haven't talked much about it, but I'm, sh I'm shifting into Twitch because that's where kids watch stuff. They watch long, they will watch someone stream video games for three to four hours. Which that's crazy to me. I don't know. I, again, each generation to their own. I'm trying to think of what I watched as a kid, you know. I just watched TV like that. Yeah, and TV, you had to wait during fucking commercials and shit. Like people have no idea. It's like dating now where people are like, you just get to hit up the person directly. I had to call their fucking house and their dad <laughs> might answer. And if their mom was harsh, they answered. Like you had to put in the work. You know, you couldn't date multiple people because you didn't have time. You had to get on your bike, ride over or get in a car and drive. You couldn't be in multiple places having multiple connections, which, hey, that facilitates this conversation on some level. So there's always beauty, you know, to everything that's expansive, but there's always a shadow side, which, you know, I was asking you about, about social media. Like Twitch is really interesting because they're observing you. So you're able to one, navigate, have these conversations, meet kids in video games to talk about. And like, it's such a cool thing because you're meeting them 
where they are. Where they're at, where they're at, where they want to be, where they want to be. And it, and what's cool about it too is like, I teach kids growth mindset and self-talk. Those are two major things I do. And I do it specifically about how they view themselves. So we're learning a lot about growth mindset in schools, specifically around like, it's like practice growth mindset when you're learning, but also practice growth mindset in your personal life. And so instead of like teaching it from a show, which is what I thought we were going to do, I was like, well, I can talk about growth mindset in video games because I'm not good. Like the kids will actively see me get better, right? But it was also really interesting because some of the kids started to try to teach me. And I was like, this is actually a really great empathy building exercise for kids because what they've learned is being good at something doesn't mean you're good at teaching it, right? And so kids were like, what's wrong with you? Like, so this one kid, I can tell this because it was a success, a success story and i like a huge fan of this kid. I've been working with him for like nine months at this point. But we were playing Fortnite and we were in a battle and it was like the pressure was on and he just started screaming at me. He was like, what are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And, I, and like there was two people shooting at us. We we're shooting at two people. I just put my remote down and he was watching me. And he's like, what are you doing? Pick your remote up. And I was like, oh, ugh, absolutely not. And I put my headphones off and we lost. I was like, look, how would you feel if when I was trying to help you with your communication skills, I yelled at you? And he was like, uh, I wouldn't feel good. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, and how do you think I felt when we were playing that game when you were yelling at me? And he was like, well, I was trying to help you. And I was like, do teachers help you when they yell at you when you're learning? And he was like, no. And I was like, so what could have helped in that moment? He was like, uh, not yelling. And I'm like, yeah, that's the first step, right? But also let's think about what else we could have done. And so I was like, I won't play video games with you like that. I won't do it. I was like, I don't let anybody talk to me like that. I don't care how good you are at the game. I don't care how much you have to offer me. If you're screaming at me like that, I'm done. I'm absolutely done. And so two days later, his mom emailed me and she was like, he used his allowance to buy me like a Fortnite skin. And it wasn't even just an apology. He was like, you've gotten so much better. And here are the three areas that you've gotten better. And I just wanted to like get this as a gift to say congratulations. And it was like, see that huge shift, right? Of, and just understanding. And I have a kid right now who's in high school and he's like my manager for my Twitch, which is hilarious because it's just him being so frustrated with me all the time. But even if you go back and start watching from when he was my manager to now, I have to check him a lot. Where I'm like, check yourself. I'm learning. I am new. If I don't understand something, I need you to help me understand it. And then he said, he was like, man, he's like, no wonder teachers get so frustrated. And I was like, yeah, right. But it's, again, we don't really talk about that aspect of it. And so you, if you have someone that's naturally more patient or someone that likes to explain things, right, someone who, who can kind of hold space for that, then you have teachers who do that. But a lot of times, even saying something like, you still don't get it, or like, like what, what, like, what are you doing? Or like, how did you get this? It brings shame to learning, right? And so then I had another kid who's teaching me Minecraft. In Minecraft, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. They're like, you're just like, you're like mining for things, right? But he helped me, he helped me build a house. And he's like, this is really good. Here are some areas where you could like improve, right? But you should be proud of this. And I was so excited that after our call, I just played Minecraft for like two more hours because I was pumped. And so I was like, I, I shared that with kids. I was like, my motivation went up when I felt like I was getting better, right? When I felt like I knew what I was, I knew what I was at least trying to learn. And also I had someone that was holding space for the learning process because I'm such a perfectionist that being bad at something makes me feel like not good about myself. The moment, you asked me the moment that I had, it's all kind of connected to this. The first year that I was teaching the kids that I had to say goodbye to during the pandemic. I had them for two years and we left. It was their eighth grade. They didn't get to graduate with us. So I'm doing something like fingers crossed with my show to surprise them, but I know none of them will. Um, none of them will ruin the surprise if they hear. But I like the first year I was teaching them, I gave everything to them. Like I was holding space for every problem. No problem was too small. My boss pulled me aside and was like, you don't have to do that. And I was like, well, that's why I am the teacher I am. And I was like on my high horse and stuff like, well, maybe if more teachers did that, right? And I didn't understand what he was saying. But then it hit me pretty hard was like, I was taking on a lot of emotional work and I, I didn't have any place or opportunity to kind of take care of myself or release it. 
he was worried about that. And so I had one of the hardest days. I've struggled with depression since I was a kid. And sometimes I go, I get, it gets really bad. And I had a week where it was really bad. And I just going to school would normally pull me out of whatever funk I was in, but I couldn't even make eye contact with the kids. I got to school this one day and I was like, Miss, Miss Danny, my co-teacher, I was like, Danny, you got to teach. Like, I feel like I am like a black hole in this room right now. Like I'm, I'm not doing well. And I remember the kids kept trying to make eye contact with me because they're the homies. They're trying to connect with you. Yeah, they're trying to connect. Sometimes when she was teaching, they would like try to like get in trouble with me. Right. Like, but that's the kind of relationship we have is they try to, they try to get me to like mess around and be silly. So they'll try to get my attention. But I had this kid who I just adore and and they looked up at me and they just looked so worried. They looked so worried. And then that's when I was like, I got to go because they should not be worried about this. I don't want them to think this is about them. Right. And I went to an emergency like therapy, like Kaiser Permanente offered like last minute kind of if you feel like you're in danger and and to tell you the truth I was starting to feel that way where I was like I have nothing left to give I don't want to be alive I don't want to be here and I went and I talked to this lady and she she changed my life she talked with me for three hours which she should not have done she just offered that time to me and I was very adamant about I need to be back on medicine and she talked to me about self-love and she was like here she was like if these are the signs that I thought you were going to harm yourself I would, I would get you help like that. But she was like, but I feel like this is what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that there's a lack of self-love. So she asked me this question and I think about it all the time. She said, if I was to drop you on like a deserted island by yourself for a year with all basic amenities met, so just no communication, you're just there, there's food, there's water, it's just you. She was like, how would you feel? And I literally said, who would I help? And I started crying and she was like, okay, cool. Right. And I just thought about that's torture for me. What would I do? Who would I be if I didn't, if I wasn't helping or communicating or connecting with someone? And so she, she recommended a book to me uh, called love yourself. Like your life depends on it. And I listened to it all in one day, like that same day. And then I made a commitment. It was like, this book was all about like not having self-love. And I realized that even though I was doing really positive work, it was still coming from this place of I feel unsafe and I have to, and you give everything or you're nothing. And uh, it, it changed everything. And, and five years later, it's like, please drop me on an island for a year. Please, like I would, <laughs> do you know how grateful I would be to have some time to myself over the past five years? I felt like you know, a, a jerk because I suddenly didn't have to be there for everyone and I didn't have to spend time with everyone and I got to like choose when I did it. But when the Today Show thing happened last year, it blew everything else up again because suddenly people were like, we see your work, that's you. We need you, we need this. People were sending me messages saying like, you have to save the kids. And someone sent me a message saying I was like the second coming of Christ. And people were sending me messages of them crying, talking about like, like people were booking my consult con, uh, consultations just to talk because they were like, I need someone to talk to and you're the person. And it's like, that's not my job. That's not what I do. But people were putting this pressure on. You're a born teacher. You were born to do this. This is your destiny, blah, blah, blah. This is like personal growth on steroids. It's like your whole shadow is being like. <laughs> and then getting all this feedback from production companies and saying like, wow, your, your work is so important. You don't have any followers. Right. And so then having to like, I had to question myself and I was doubting myself. Like your worth is valued in your followers. Is I mean, I see people struggle with that all the time. Yeah. And it's like, I've never questioned these things before then. And so I had, I had to get back to the basics. I had to get back to like, who is this work for? What do I want in the world? What do I want to do that makes me feel good? Right. How am I taking care of myself? Am I going on dates? Am I having hobbies? Am I spending time with my friends? Am I having days where I don't answer the phone? Right. Like making sure that I'm, I am manually separating myself from Dono Friend. Dono Friend is my work. Right. But in reality, if I said tomorrow I'm done with that, people have to deal with it. I don't owe that to anybody. I get to choose. I'm going to choose to do it because it's the work I love and it's the work that I've cultivated, but I choose it. I don't do it because people tell me I have to do it, 
right? I don't care what anyone says. I, there's a second job out there already waiting for me. I'm going to work with elephants eventually. That's just putting it out there. Like I'm eventually going to step away from working with kids. And I'm going to work with elephants. But I think like this past year, if I didn't have that connection to myself, I would have, I would have taken these opportunities that weren't aligned with me. Or I would have like, you know, when I had agents drop me or when I had people say, you're not doing enough or, you know, this is what your content should look like. I would have listened to them, but I don't listen. I don't, I, I can't because I will always be true to my work. And now I will always be true to myself, you know, and these things are, this is important. And it comes from, it comes from doing the work. It comes from doing the work of trusting myself and forgiving myself and and checking the expectations I'm setting, you know, holding myself accountable and and making what I want out of my life versus what I think other people. And the Twitch thing, everyone was like, that's weird. That's not going to work. And I love it. I love it. The kids will, the kids hang out, they play video games with me, they talk about their day, they talk about their life and it's it's a blast. And this is where I want to go. No, that's beautiful. I mean, everybody has an opinion about how someone should do things. I see this all the time with my work too, where it's like a lot of people want you to be who they need. And when you're not that thing, they will try to shame or cancel or manipulate or do whatever to get you back in the box that keeps them comfortable. And I see that so much. And it's hard because, of course, the paradox of being a recovering people pleaser is it's hard to hold that disappointment, even if it's from a stranger. That's why the internet is such a powerful place in terms of behavior manipulation, because you have a stranger's expectations of you. And when you disappoint them, they're hiding behind a cat profile picture, you know, like they're not. In my like, I don't, I don't really talk about this enough, but my TikTok, for instance, Right. My TikTok. TikTok comments are savage too sometimes. Well, and I haven't gotten it. The only thing I get rough on TikTok is about my fingers being clubbed. And usually people will just make a comment about my fingers looking weird, but I'm used to that. That's something I've gotten. God, people are such little pricks sometimes. People just do random stuff or people will send me messages in all caps being like, you're dying, get your fingers checked. And I'm like, I know, I know it's all good. It's hereditary. Everything's fine. When I made my TikTok, the kids made me do it. The kids were like, you're so goofy. Like, just make a TikTok. Kids will love you. And because they knew that I wanted to be a speaker. And I was like, no, please, that's not going to work. But then when the pandemic hit, I realized I could do, I could show the work without putting the kids in harm's way. I have a lot of feelings about using kids on social media. I, I get that they're cute and I get that it's funny and stuff like that at times. But I think we don't often think enough about the impact it will have on kids and their future when we put them on social media, when we show their vulnerable moments on social media. And so I, I didn't ever just take recordings of my class or my after school program. But when I was doing it online, I was like, well, I can record myself and you can hear them and I can ask for permission and stuff, but you don't see them and I'm not using their names. But what happened was like, I think after the first month that my first couple of videos went viral, the kids were like, okay, so when are you going to make a TikTok for kids? And that, like, it killed me. I was like, but it is for kids. And they're like, no, it's like for adults. Cause now it's just all the emotional stuff. So people were seeing my TikTok and they're like this emotional stuff, the way he talks to kids. I felt like I could only show that. And so I stopped showing my personality. I started just showing like the serious moments. And after a while it got stale. People were like, it's the same video. He's saying the same positive things to kids. But I was, I was feeling so anxious around TikTok. My followers would go up or go down or I would post a video and it would get no views. And I'm like, well, this doesn't matter. And this is what happens when you show yourself. But I just quickly stopped enjoying my TikTok. It wasn't about you anymore. It wasn't about the kids. Well, it wasn't about the kids. It was about performance. It was performative. And then it was like, that's how everyone is seeing me, where they're just seeing this like emotional, like, you know, I'm always talking to the kids about growth and blah, blah, blah. But 90% of the time with kids is us laughing and having fun, which is a huge part of the work in general. 10% of that are those kind of deeper moments. And so when I started doing Twitch again and I'm playing with the kids and I'm enjoying myself and I'm getting feedback from people. They're like, you look so happy. And I'm like, this is the work I got to do. And I'm going to make this work. And I'm going to, this is, this is their generation's Mr. Rogers anyways, in terms of like where they would find it would be a streamer or someone. But it was just so interesting to have this whole year of like, I just got good with myself. <laughs> like I just got good with myself and now the whole world is making me question myself and you know, blah, blah, blah. But I, I, I think if I hadn't have been doing that work before, it would have crushed me. I think that this past year would have absolutely wrecked me. And I think because I, I, my intention for the past five years has been to develop a relationship with myself, I was able to show up for myself 
in ways that I never even knew I would have to in, in the past. So it all comes back down to self. Well, your work is, is, is not just incredible, it's fun. And your way of communicating it is fun. And your ability to tell a story is incredible. And listen, there's nothing, I really resonate a lot with the things you're saying because I remember I have a friend who's a clairvoyant who said to me, this is about two years ago. She said, when you're on Instagram and the videos you do, like they're cute. And you know, as soon as someone says they're cute, you're about to get other feedback. She's like, they're cute. And you're like good at it. And it's funny. And people learn. She's like, but at some point you're going to want to talk about other things and your content is no longer going to resonate because it's not real. And I remember like a year and a half later feeling this like desire to talk about other things, to explore other subjects, but feeling imprisoned by the identity I'd created and the expectation of that identity. And when I went out of it, people would say, stay in your lane or do this or do that, or I don't like when you do this. And I could feel this, this battle again of authentic self versus what wasn't performative was authentic previously, but I wasn't allowing myself a different iteration, right? Like that thing you said earlier, you think you know. And I, I started to have these awarenesses of like, sometimes the dream you have is not the dream you had. Like you achieve the thing or you get to a place or you don't. And we often don't allow ourselves to evolve too because someone likes who we've been or maybe we get celebrated or maybe we get love. And I think anytime you tie applause to anything, then it instantly can reinforce staying stuck in the prison of that applause, which I don't know that we, I think social media has really reinforced that. And it's like, oh, well, I posted that picture or that video and that did well. So that must be what people want from me, which I've certainly thought that, oh, like people like this content. And it's this constant battle of like being able to recognize what is authentic self-expression at the cost of being loved, which is every healthy, loving, beautiful relationship in human system actually orients around truth first, you know, but man, that's hard. And it's just so funny because it circles all the way back to the very first thing we talked about, which is like the Mr. Rogers, right? Was like, my goal was to leave the classroom and like try to make a YouTube channel and like see where things went. Like I had no idea how I was going to do this. And then the Today Show found me, like I had gotten a little bit of success and I had a couple of opportunities to do some podcasts. I got to talk with like Kara and, Ka um, Kara and Caleb and then like Danielle Laporte and stuff like that. Oh, I know. Danielle Laporte's amazing. Yeah, she, she put that video on her page just like without even reaching out. And she was like, it just was on her page suddenly. And I was like, oh, cool. And she invited me to her podcast or we did a live together. And, you know, when the Today Show thing happened, I talked, I talked to them for like maybe an hour and a half. They interviewed me like 11 times. Like they just kept calling my phone and they're like, here's a new interview person. And then Hoda found out about it. And then she wanted to do it. And she was so amazing. And it, again, it's a huge honor, but then suddenly everyone was like, well, that's who this guy is. Like some people didn't even know I was working with middle school or high schoolers. And so when they started saying he wants to make a TV show, I had a very specific idea in mind, but all these other production companies were like Mr. Rogers-esque. That's not what I kind of wanted to do. And thankfully I'm working with a, an actress right now who's amazing and she's helping kind of safeguard me from some of that alteration stuff that's happening. But it's wild because it was like, I, and I even think about this for kids, you know, like we will tell kids like you're amazing or you're great or you're fantastic or you're wonderful or you're perfect or blah, blah, blah. And then when kids don't feel that way, there's like this weird shame or guilt or disconnect that happens. And so positive pressure is like a real thing. We have to really check our expectations or how we're delivering them to people. Because once I was like Mr. The, the Mr. Rogers, I got to go on all these podcasts. Suddenly all these like people who I know in my whole life were re reaching out and sharing my work. And, you know, like some of my favorite bands were sharing my, I mean, it was wild, but I just immediately felt like I have to stick to this. I have to stick to this because this is, but the more I've been looking at my content recently, the, the more disconnected I've been feeling from it. It was because it's just like, it's not me. That's not, and I've never been someone who can just put on a mask and be like, cool, I'm a somebody else. I've always authentically been myself, even when I was struggling. And so right now I'm, I'm about to start this whole new phase of like, I'm doing content that I want. I'm pushing into where I think this is, I'm, I'm following my heart, I'm following my ideas. And if people don't like it, then they're going to have to just move on or find somebody else to do it. But I can't let myself get bogged down by what I think others expect from me, you know? What a beautiful mirror for me too. I love it. Thank you for uh, living in that and, and, 
and living on that edge, you know, that edge of like, you're just following the feeling, following the call, following the boundaries, following the feeling of what isn't a hell yeah. You know, there's that saying, like, if it's not a fuck yes, it's a hell no. It's so hard to live in that sometimes, especially when perceived success or perceived stability comes from the maybe or the no or the, the, uh, and it's, I mean, it's such a demonstration of the willingness to let it all fall apart or die or old behaviors, old ways, old, they all have, it's like the skin is constantly falling off. You know, it's, it's such a beautiful process. And it's a reminder that if you don't know what's about to happen, it's a good reminder you're creating something new. And thank you for living that and being that. So a declaration of what are you now, what's like your heart calling to create from like the depths of your being, can you declare it to the world? Yeah, well, I had, I can't tell too much about it because they're kind of like making me be hush hush about stuff, but dance around the edges of the NDA. Yeah, I definitely will. They, I, I think I had a lot of production companies reach out to me in the beginning and I've been, I've been working with some people and some companies who really believe in the work and don't want to cheapen it, which is really important to me. But I think I have a vision for the next year. And my vision is to be in at least 50 middle schools speaking to kids. I've written a presentation for middle schoolers around video games and growth mindset. I'm putting it out there and doing the intentional work towards like some kind of sponsorship from Twitch or some kind of sponsorship from like PlayStation or someone to help bring to these schools. But I, it's a part of a, it's a part of a larger program that I want to create. And I, I know that it's right for me because I've had multiple days in the past two weeks where I'm just up writing until four o'clock at night and planning and developing and feeling excited and, yeah, I just, I, I think I'm going to bring the work back to the kids. That's my, that's this next vision. And and however that turns out, I'm not sure how it's going to be in the end, but my goal is like to get out of this home office <laughs> and to get back into these schools and talking to kids and, and kind of organically grassroots grow my Twitch channel and, and have kids start to know me and start to, you know, connect me with speaking about this stuff um, in a fun, like, you know, a safe environment. I'm just excited. I'm excited to get out there and and to, to talk to kids, talk to kids about what really matters. And I know that the TV show stuff will come. I'm not as anxious or pressed about it as I was last year. Um, I think I've waited long enough to know that I can trust my heart and this this vision I have for this series is really, really good. And yeah, I got my fingers crossed. I should know pretty soon kind of the next steps for it. But uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm looking forward to introducing the world to me on my terms. Fuck yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't said that out loud before. It feels good. I'm looking forward to introducing the world to me on my terms. Everybody replicate that tattoo. Well, you don't have to tattoo it, but if you did, <laughs> that is a good tattoo. Thank you so much for sharing your heart and your mission and your passion. Uh, this has been a, a really transformational conversation for me and I'm sure for the people listening. I mean, I, you know, I, you've done a lot for me already individually. And since the first like time I ran in on the call with Jen Pasloff and stuff, uh, look, I, I really, I haven't had a lot of opportunities to authentically be myself in my work lately. And this is one of the first ones I've had in a long time. And it's a huge honor to, to be with you, first of all, and also to be with your audience. And it's wild how much when we lift each other up, we can open up stuff for each other. And so I just know, I know ahead of time that this is already going to open up a lot of stuff for me because it's so, it's so aligned. So I really, from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate you having me here and I look forward to continuing to do the work with you and, and continuing to see how both of our work evolves. Amen. Uh, where can people find more of you? So I have a website, uh, donovantaylorhall.com and that is for coaching and speaking, but otherwise I'm Dono friend. So D O N O F R I E N D Dono friend everywhere. Somehow no one has used that name before. And so on Twitch, on Instagram, on YouTube, if you look up Dono Friend, like that stuff will pop up. But I definitely, if you are listening to this and you have kids that watch Twitch, please send them to my channel. It is family friendly. It is a very fun place to be. You're also welcome. But otherwise, yeah, you can check out my website. And yeah, I think that's it. We'll link it all in the show notes. Uh, thanks again. Nice. 
Thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode. If this episode resonated with you, one of the best ways to support the show is to go subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any more. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to it, or share the episode with your community on Instagram or whatever social place you like to hang out. This helps get it into more people's ears, and I'm so grateful for your support, always. Thanks again for tuning in. Much love.